Hello and welcome to Security Scan. I am Uday Bhaskar. This week, we look at a tragic event, a terror attack on a hospital in Kabul on the 8th of March that killed almost 40 innocents and injured many others. The Islamic State claimed responsibility for this dastardly attack, rendered all the more reprehensible for the attackers came dressed as medics and doctors. This is not the first time an Afghan hospital has been targeted by terrorists. We had an instance in May 2011 when six innocents were killed in a terror attack. But at that time, it was the Taliban that had claimed responsibility for this particular attack. Over the last few years, the corrosive ideology that encourages such violence has found many advocates, be it the Taliban or now the Islamic State. What does this mean for India? This question is relevant for on the same day, namely March 8th, an Islamic State supporter was neutralized by security forces in Lucknow and a large quantity of arms and ammunition was seized from his house. What does the Kabul attack mean for Afghanistan? And what does the visible spread of the Islamic State's ideology mean for the neighborhood and India's security? To discuss these issues, we have an eminent panel. Allow me to welcome and introduce Ms. Bretta Peterson. She is currently a senior fellow at the ORF and has had a long association with Afghanistan. Mr. Samir Basim, an independent Afghan analyst who has also spent almost 15 years in Afghanistan in different capacities. And Lieutenant General Atha Hasnain, a former GOC of the 15 Corps, also long years of experience in dealing with low intensity conflict and internal security. Ms. Peterson, if I could turn to you first. You spent many years in Afghanistan, both as a journalist and as part of an NGO. What was distinctive about this attack on a hospital where A, it's the Islamic State, and two, they come dressed as doctors and carry out the attack? Yes. Uh Obviously, it was a horrific attack if we just try to put ourselves into the shoes of the people there in the hospital, helpless people who are, who are in bed. Uh, there was a doctor who was uh, apparently attacked while he was performing an, an, an operation. There were stories of uh, patients who actually heard that there was a shootout and they tried to you know, put together the beds in their room and block the door so that, that, that nobody could cut him in. It must have been a, a, a horrific uh, a, a day for, for those people, really terrorizing. And uh, of course, after that, um, the Taliban immediately, and that was, uh, I think, quite interesting, uh, declared that they had nothing to do with it. And later on, the Islamic State um, claimed responsibility for the attack. I think what is interesting about that is that uh, many Afghans, after the attack, um, had come up and said that um, this cannot have been possibly done by any Afghans because it is just too horrific and it is obviously uh, an attack that has nothing to do with the presence of foreign troops. There is it's an attack on innocent, helpless Afghans. And I think that is the way of how Afghans are increasingly seeing, seeing this war, uh, that it is actually a war against the Afghan people. Uh, you know, this is the refrain that I also saw on many of the blogs saying that an Afghan could not have done this. But Mr. Basin, if I could draw you in on this, which is the Islamic State in Afghanistan and the Taliban <coughs> in Afghanistan and certain red lines when it comes to innocents, women, children and in this case, patients in a hospital. So how would you describe this? Quickly, uh, ISIS emerged publicly in Afghanistan in 2014. They have relatively limited support from the Afghans and they have been, like in other parts of the world, they have been very brutal with Afghan civilians. Taliban, normally uh, civilian casualties are what we call collateral damage. They have never targeted civilians. I have been in Kabul for 15 years. Uh, they target the US coalition forces. They have targeted the Afghan national security forces. And uh, uh, so this, this is an issue. The Afghans, uh, and these are, as Britta mentioned, uh, a large degree of foreign fighters who have no local uh, local roots. And uh, 
Also, I heard that um, from certain sources that this specific attack, uh, that there was a, a targeted intelligence security official who was under treatment in the hospital who may have been the target for this attack. Now, on this, I just want to push you a little further. Since you spent many years over there, the average Afghan, forget about Pashtun, non-Pashtun, and how do they relate to this whole code of whom can you attack? You know, how would you, what has been your experience? <coughs> so, see, uh, Taliban recruits across the border. As you know that ISIS is on the AFPAC border in the province called Nangarhar. And their own uh, leader was killed in April. Hafiz uh, uh, Saeed was killed, Khan was killed in 2016. Interestingly, he was not on the UN terrorist list by drone attacks. The US has been attacking, has had two, 200 drone strikes in that area. Okay, And they have been very brutal to the local populations. You know, they rule them by intimidation and brutality. So they have no local support and they are not from the re from the area. Most so of you them. really see this as outside. But Atha, can I bring you in on this? You know, there are a couple of issues before I draw you into the question of India and the IS. This whole, you know, the code of conduct is, has a socio-cultural and a religious dimension. I can't imagine that anybody can argue this on the basis of Islam and say that Islam allows such an attack on innocent, vulnerable people. So how do you characterize this <coughs> distinction, Taliban, Islamic State and targeting innocents? You see, it's a question of how radical you really have become. I think the Taliban was born, as, you, as you're aware, in the, in the refugee camps uh, around Peshawar and the Northwest Frontier Province, uh, was radicalized, but perhaps not radicalized to that extent. And uh, it was more of a political uh, entity when it came into being and uh, was, was then transposed onto Afghanistan. The Islamic State has acquired a strange kind of an ideology where uh, it is very, very Arabized and they have used terror and actually the whole concept of cruelty um, to send home their message. Uh, you've seen beheadings, you've seen uh, live people being put to fire, you've seen the Jordanian pilot, pilot. the manner in which he was killed. So I think the, 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 the IS and the Daesh philosophy of um, radicalism is much more intense than what it is for anyone else. All of them come under the larger umbrella term of Wahhabiyat, as you say. You know, uh, typical Sunni, Wahhabi, uh, Salafi kind of a strain. But um, obviously they're trying to send home a message, trying to, trying to bring in this fact that uh, every non-Muslim is an enemy and needs to be put to death. That is the kind of message which the IS has been trying to send. Would the you Taliban only say non-Muslim or non-Sunni? You know, as far as I would I... say yes. Uh, I would qualify that everyone who is a. In fact, they count non-Sunnis as yeah. non-Muslims. Okay. The Shia, the Ahmadiyya, or anyone for that matter is a non-Muslim. So your basic sort of distillate is that the IS is more extreme in terms of its violence and its brutality, and the Taliban perhaps has been lesser so in terms of. Recent, you know, our experience over the years. Yes, that the be experience over the, over the years. Samir, yes. I want to bring you back on another issue, which is how do the major states perceive the Islamic State itself? We're talking about Russia. We're talking about China. And how they are now engaging both Afghanistan and Pakistan. So what is your assessment about the Russia, China, Pakistan kind of this locus in relation to both Afghanistan and the Islamic State? This is very, very interesting, especially in relation to Afghanistan and India is that uh, we have uh, over the last uh, couple of years seen Russia, Iran and China engaging with the Taliban. And as you and in this put, put it in the context is that now for the Afghan people, uh, Taliban looks like a lesser evil compared to the IS. Okay. And because they, the Russia, Iran and China see a threat from the IS in the region and they are open to talks with the Taliban and then which also brings into eminence the role of Pakistan which is a uh, which makes the situation very complicated so it will and it weakens the afghan government <coughs> because uh, somewhere they lose the path in their eminence as an afghan led afghan owned peace process so what you're suggesting is that both moscow and beijing seem to be of the view that by engaging with taliban not just islamabad but perhaps rawalpindi the army, the Pakistan military and intelligence, they are in a better position to deal with the Islamic State and what it poses. Mm -hmm. Britta, would you agree with that formulation about Russia and China in relation to the Islamic State? Um, well, my impression is that um, in Afghanistan we are perceiving actually a power vacuum uh, due to the fact that um, 
that Donald Trump has not properly formulated what the U.S. are going to do after this half kind of uh, withdrawal that they, they, they have been doing so far. So if you look at what Russia has been doing, uh, not only in Afghanistan, but all over the world, uh, it's uh, that they are trying to regain uh, a large power status uh, by reclaiming uh, ground that uh, the former Soviet Union has lost. So uh, I think Russia sees an opportunity at the moment <coughs> in, in Afghanistan to, to step in, uh, which uh, is highly problematic, I think, if you look at the, the, the record that Russia has had so far. In but, you know, opportunity, yes. But would you, as an analyst who's been following the region, mm -hmm. you know, agree that the Islamic State and the ideology that it represents poses a threat both to Russia and China in Xinjiang and the Central Asian provinces adjoining Russia. How would you, I mean, is it a serious threat for them or is it just geopolitics? Uh, personally, I think China, you know how China is, is also dealing with other minorities. So they are worried about uh, minority issues. I would see it in the case of Russia as as a power gambler. As a power. Um, Atta, you want to comment I, on this? I, I yeah. would just like to disagree slightly on that. As far as Russia is concerned, you must remember, 11% of the population of Russia is Islamic. Dagestan, Chechnya. And they've had bad experiences in both. My, uh, I, had a, I, had a, I had a visit to Moscow where I did speak to some of the think tanks. And what I could gather from there is that Russia was concerned, particularly about Central Asia. It was extremely concerned. <laughs> Uh, about uh, its own internal security and the possibility that the Islamic State, after getting squeezed out of uh, the Middle East, out of West Asia, uh, it had the option it could go to Africa or it could probably try and enter into Central Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan because primarily this area appears to give a lucrative option of uh, the availability of a tremendous amount of money coming from the narcotics traffic. And that is the prime reason why the Russians are extremely worried about what's happening in Afghanistan and what is the potential that the IS has towards okay, Central Asia. Fair enough. If you say Russia has reason to be extremely worried, how would you characterize China and IS? And then I'm going to bring you into the real sort of issue, India and the IS. And you just have 90 seconds. Okay. <laughs> China. Let me bring in China. Uh, I think China's understanding of Islam, <laughs> radical Islam as a threat is still in a very fledgling state. It, hasn't ta it has taken Xinjiang, Xinjiang rather, uh, rather seriously, but it doesn't know really how to handle it. Its relationship with Pakistan is an awkward relationship where it sees tremendous amount of interest in it and not being able to perceive as to how Pakistan can, also, can actually be a blowback as far as Xinjiang is concerned. So I would say Pakistan's, uh, China's interests in Afghanistan are more concerning its security more concerning is economic options and hugely concerning the one belt, one road. Okay. That is the aspect. That's China. What about India then? As far as India is concerned and this incident which took, took place in India on the 8th of March, 9th of March also was, I would say, a little beyond being a coincidence. And uh, why I say that is, I think the Islamic State is under pressure in Syria, in, in Iraq, in what's happening in Mosul, what's happening in other parts of northern Syria and northern Iraq. Uh, and I think it is trying to send out a message that all is not over with, the, with, with, with it. It is trying to have a coordinated kind of an approach to operations in the South Asian region, which appears to be one of the options towards which uh, IS is looking. Um, I would say the importance of IS in India is started with Shami Witness, as you're aware, in Bangalore. Almost the software. Three years, three years ago, the software. Uh, engineer, it took us eight months to to realize that he was uh, he was functioning from Bangalore. Thereafter, we didn't hear too much about it. But as far as the the Indian footprint is concerned on the <laughs> IS, I would say um, uh, we have a very small footprint of of our manpower having gone there. Uh, then our, our people are not considered as to be the finest of terrorists and the finest of foot soldiers uh, in that region. But that doesn't uh, sort of. Uh, rule out the possibility that they are looking at the 500 million Islamic population in all over South Asia. Yeah, yeah. Pakistan, Bangladesh, India put together. On both flanks, if this is happening, it is bound to happen in India you know, too. Bangladesh, I think, is a very, very important kind of, shall we say, area, perhaps potentially for the ideology of the Islamic State. But I'll hopefully come back to that. Mr. Basim, in terms of Afghanistan and how the government and the intelligence agencies are looking at the Islamic State, after all, there are some factions within Afghanistan, even politically, that would like the Taliban to be accommodated. 
But what is your assessment again about the intelligence agencies? Can they deal with the threat posed by the Islamic State? Or do you think we'll see a far more violent, messy, bloody Afghanistan in the year, next year or two? So I think they are very concerned. And uh, the fact that Russia, Iran and China had, had talks with the Taliban, which even India and Afghanistan initially did not participate in, which is a serious concern to them. And the other thing is that they have, uh, as you know, recently um, uh, had talks with and uh, got Gul Gulbuddin Hikmatyar out of the UN terrorist list and back to the fold. So there is an engagement going on with Taliban separately, but I, I feel there are multiple cross purposes working here and they perceive IS as a big threat. In fact, the President Ghani had, I remember about 18 months back, called the media and highlighted the fact of the presence of IS and asked them to, you know, highlight it in the, in the, the public in media. Uh, Britta, if I could ask you a quick question, Europe and the Islamic State, particularly Germany, you know, which has a very large, shall we say, footprint again, both in terms of the development effort under the banner of the EU. You were also in Afghanistan as part of such an effort. And the more recent kind of refugee experience, you know, where in many parts of Europe now you see this fear, the anxiety about what the immigrant, particularly the Muslim immigrant, poses and the way in which the ideology of the Islamic State is perceived. You know, how would you interpret that? IS and Europe? Maybe Germany in particular, if you would wish to share that. Well, obviously, um, uh, Europe is facing a huge problem because of the ascent of, of right-wing populist parties who actually managed to shrink the space for liberal political parties as of how you can deal with the uh, amount of refugees that are coming in. And uh, especially a country like Germany that has been engaged for uh, many years in Afghanistan uh, we had 6,000 troops in Afghanistan. Um, uh, we have a lot of personal contacts. Our contacts go back to the time of King Amanullah, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so we do have a responsibility of protecting people who are actually fleeing from that war, where we got engaged in and we do not know how to uh, settle the issue. Um, I think it would be a, a very good opportunity, and so I would like to you, you know, close yeah. the line here if um, Europe could also engage more with India and if India could use its good context that it still has to the Russian government and probably even engage Russia and uh, China to create a, a, a coalition yes. here, a regional coalition to... Um, and perhaps to, Iran also, you know, if, bring if, all uh, the... Yes, if I think politically and, uh, if Iran is. obviously is also interested in that and, and I think India could play a very constructive role here. I hope that... Uh, Quickly, Sami. Uh, I would like uh, add to that that uh, incidentally Iran, I mean India and Germany have the highest uh, goodwill in terms of relationship da right down to the people of Afghanistan. So it's we something have, we could perhaps we could utilize, utilize in a productive utilize way. Our Atai can ask you because you know de-radicalization saying that okay the Islamic State is now symbol of a certain ideology. Now the way to deal with it is obviously not just the military option. So what, how would you flag the de-radicalization effort both you know in the South Asian context and the larger global context that involves Europe, the um, North America etc. Let's look at both the Indian and the European context perhaps. In, Euro in, in Europe, of course, the biggest problem is that of first, second and third generation immigrants and the current immigrants who have, who have gone in. Uh, we all understand that the biggest problem which has been there has been the integration of the second and the third generation. And most of them, since they have not been able to acquire jobs of their, their choice, perhaps they look upon uh, their authorities with a degree of antipathy. And that's the reason why uh, elements like the IS have been able to exploit opportunities in those in the, in those areas not necessarily that all of them are radicalized completely many of them many of this isn't much of this is a, actually a socio-economic kind of a aspect in india once again you have a huge youth you have um, 180 million muslims here i think india is not the best of examples to give for this because actually india's syncretic culture militates against what the is is looking for uh, it is countries like Bangladesh, which is again also very comparatively quite syncretic, but again has a larger footprint of Muslims there. And Pakistan, which has got a major problem with military rule, feudalism, uh, poverty, lack of education, all these things put together. And a state support to terror itself. That's right, absolutely. So, if you look at India, the aspect of uh, the influence of radicalization, I would say, is the least here. And... Uh, 
That is the reason why perhaps we can take a step forward in the counter-radicalization and the de-radicalization process, which has already begun. By the way, a lot of people do not know that it has actually begun in a very big way in India. And I think we are making reasonably good strides in that. But having said that, it is Pakistan which is going to be a major problem. Uh, and uh, to an extent, Bangladesh. Bangladesh has already manifested itself in the form of a major terrorist attack last year. And I hope that these measures, which have to be very institutional, uh, and very continuous, we just can't have one-off kind of measures. And it has to have political support. It has to have a tremendous amount of social support. In today's world, social media plays a huge role. And I would say, uh, looking at the Kashmir case, for example, anything negative coming on the social media against the segment of the Kashmiris sends on terribly negative messages, which actually neutralizes all the efforts that the government may be putting in in terms of you know there's one way of looking at this is that social media is also becoming a kind of a force multiplier particularly when we are talking about you know the non-state entities and those who may have a vested interest but one question for you Samir you've been in Afghanistan for a long time both the educational system in Afghanistan which is in contrast to what you have in Pakistan you know where it appears that at a very young age the child is being encouraged to hate the other my experience of Afghanistan is very different, that there the government of the day is consciously trying to take the children down a more constructive path. So do you see any space for supporting or enabling the Afghan government and the Afghan people in that particular path? Because given its demography and geography, can social media and technology be a means or a tool for this de-radicalization that Atta is speaking about? Yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, that is a huge potential considering the large young population of Afghanistan and, uh, and who have seen peace in the last 15 years and have seen normalization. They have a stake in the peace and they, they feel uh, that they, they deserve peace. And if we encourage this interaction on social media and create what we will, means we've had these discussions over the past couple of days at different conferences, a counter narrative, so to say, you know. and. Uh, create that. Although you have to also understand that still the uh, the uh, 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 madrasas there in Afghanistan are also spreading Control. rapidly. No, so I think this counter narrative is a good point because at the end of the day, again, the ideology that drives the Islamic State and its foot soldiers is not new. The use of religion, in this case, the Islamic faith, to encourage militancy leading to terrorism, has a history that goes back to the medieval period. Its more recent manifestation can be traced to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and the manner in which the Afghan Mujahid was created. Radical Islamist terrorism became a reality in the early 90s in parts of Southern Asia, operating under different names. But the common thread was an inflexible adherence <coughs> to a puritanical interpretation of the Sunni Wahhabi Salafi Islam associated with Saudi Arabia. In the intervening years, the ill-conceived US invasion of Iraq aggravated the issue and more recently, the Islamic State emerged as a potent challenge to the state in West Asia and the competing regional and global geostrategic interests witnessed a very tangled pattern about who is supporting whom. Afghanistan and Pakistan have been targeted by the Islamic State and its affiliates over the last few years, but it merits repetition that targeting minorities and non-Sunni factions has a long history. India's constitution is committed to a secular, tolerant <coughs> polity. And while the anxiety about the Islamic State and its affiliates getting greater support among the disenchanted populace is an abiding challenge, for now, it is below the median. Yet, there can be no room for complacency and India has witnessed instances where the state has abdicated. For example, in July 2010 in Kerala, where a professor's hand was amputated over a blasphemy charge. While the intelligence agencies and security forces can prevent the next terror attack, the long-term approach must be to de-radicalize, as our discussion suggested, and the thousands who are willing to take to the path of violence and suicide bombing in the name of religion <coughs> need to be demotivated. This is a long haul. But as our discussion indicated, it is a path that must be explored and South Asian nations and their more discerning citizens need to walk this talk and nurture a more tolerant and empathetic social, religious and political environment. 
on that note allow me to thank my guests ms brita peterson mr samir basim and general ata hasnain and thank you for watching security scan goodbye